Fill that empty void. I hope you'll come running to Jesus Christ and kneel before Him and say, Good Master, what must I do to have eternal life? That's the greatest question you could ever ask. The second thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture is an exemplary devotion to the commandments of God. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but, but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. And of course the young man answers, I, I, I've kept all these from my youth. Which obviously this man knew the commandments and earnestly set out to obey them. And that, that's noble. Sometimes somewhat surprised by those that really outwardly don't make any claim to live for God. They're not in church. They're not serving the Lord in any capacity. But you ask them a few basic questions about the Bible. And they themselves may point the Ten Commandments. Though you're not supposed to kill, steal, commit adultery, though they may. But he did have that fatal flaw. Of number one, thinking the commandments would save you. I was make this plain. Obeying the Ten Commandments, following the Sermon on the Mount, the two most things most often quoted, even by unbelievers, is the way to get you to heaven. Will not save a single soul. Obeying God's commands, following the moral principle of the Sermon on the Mount is an outgrowth. It's, it's what happens after we're saved as part of our devotion to God and Lordship, part of being born again and then living the Christian life. But salvation is always by faith and faith alone in the one God says to believe in who's paid the price for our sins, and that is Jesus. So his fatal fall, number one, was thinking, obey certain commands will save. Number two, it was thinking that he had kept them all, obeyed them all perfectly from his youth. See, the Bible says we're, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. There's none that is righteous. No, not one. We have all gone out of the way. We are all condemned because of sin apart from our faith in Jesus Christ. And all the wealth and all the fame, and all the religion we would bring into our life will never save us. Only faith in Christ. And that leads me to point number four in this message. After Jesus discovered plainly this man's fatal flaw, he responded by giving him a command. And it would have been a soul-saving command. Not that selling all we have and giving to the poor saves us. Salvation is not work. Or it's not by works. What it would have done is demonstrate that this stuff in my life is no longer my God. Not my houses, not my land, not my cattle, not all my possessions, not my gold, not my silver. That's not what I'm living for. That's not what I'm desiring to serve. I would be willing to give it all up to follow the Lord. And so Jesus is going to actually put that idea to the test. He says, then Jesus beholding him loved him. This was a, a statement, an act of love. Said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, give it to the poor, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross. That means faith in the cross and a life lived sacrificially for the glory of God. Take up the cross and follow me. This is the way of salvation. Following Jesus is an outgrowth of that salvation as Lordship. But if there's anything, any devotion, any affection, any love that separates us or substitutes in our life...
that devotion that should be for God, it will wreck and ruin our faith. It will lead us away from God as an unbeliever. It will prevent us from ever accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and then knowing God. Numerous times in my time in ministry, I will have tried to reach out to someone who is genuinely seeking after God. But they've not yet found it. Do I give up my livelihood the way that I put food on my table in their mind? Or do I keep one foot in the world, an unseemly, ungodly aspect of the world, and try to put the other one in the church and in serving God? And I'm telling you, the Bible says you can't have two masters. You'll serve the one and hate the other, be devoted to the one and hate the other. You can't serve both God and man. And I have seen this played out before my eyes. This says in verse 22, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. The one that, I'm telling you, the one that is given the choice, they're tempted with the ways of the world, the allurement of wealth, of power, of fame, or whatever it may be, whatever you would define as wealth, and they choose wealth over God, they are never happy with that decision. And they will most likely be miserable all their days. And in the end, when they perish, when they die, they can't take anything they've gained in this life with them into the next life. But when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, <coughs> You receive a treasure in heaven that moss and rust can't destroy, thieves can't break in and steal. It is there forever. And where your treasure is, the Bible says, there will your heart be also. Now one final word, I don't think we even have it with the outline behind me. My last point after this disastrous decision is that Jesus to me did give a great word of hope. Choosing Christ over the things of the world is not easy. This is a great, great, great temptation. In our own strength, we can't choose Christ. But Jesus helps us. He sends the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit into our life. He fills us with His Spirit. He starts cleansing our mind. He starts pulling us to Himself. He helps us say no to the world and yes to God if we'll let Him. Because as this says, all things are possible to God. I don't care who you are, what you have, what decisions you've made in the past, how you may have chosen the things of this world over the things of God time and time and time again, God can help you break that pattern today. And you can receive the joy and peace of knowing that Jesus Christ is in your life, of knowing that your name is written in heaven, of knowing that you're laying up treasure in heaven that will last forever. You can have that peace today if you'll only allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and help you make the right choice. Don't yield to the temptations of this world. Yield to the love of God as it's being bestowed upon you in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time that you give me to preach each week. Lord, I thank you for this message, for this that I've read from your holy word. Father, my heart still, 2,000 years after the fact, goes out to this young man who had so much and in his attempt to retain the so much he had of this world's treasure, he lost out on the treasure waiting for him in heaven. Father, may no one here make that choice. If there's anything in our life hindering our relationship with you, may we set it aside, give it up, knowing that what you'll give us will be far, far, far better. Lord, if there's one here needing Christ as Savior, one here needing to follow Jesus as Lord of their life, if there's a family here needing to join our church, Lord, may they come now as we extend an invitation.
Bless them and touch them right now. May they be obedient to the call of your own, that you have on their life. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand.